So hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ingrid Mitmanskruber, and I have the great honor to introduce and interview Kate Green today. Uh, she is the keynote speaker for this year's Humanities Symposium. And um, she is a writer and a former laser, laser physicist whose poetry and prose have appeared in Aeon, The Atlantic, Discover, The Economist, Harvard Review, um, The New Yorker, The New York Times Book Review, Slate, Wired, and others. Her essays have been featured on NPR's All Things Considered and Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, CBC News Radio, and the BBC World Service. She's taught writing at Vanderbilt University, San Francisco State University, the Tennessee Prison for Women, and at Columbia University as a poetry teaching fellow. In 2013, Green was the crew writer and second in command on a four month simulated Mars mission for the NASA funded High Seas Project. Her memoir in essays based on, is an, in essays based on experience, Once Upon a Time I Lived on Mars was published by St. Martin's Press in 2020. She lives in San Francisco and New York. So please let's welcome Kate Green, who will be speaking to us about language boredom and poetry as seen through the lens of information theory. So welcome, Kate. Thank you so much uh, for that warm welcome and the generous invitation to speak at this very interesting symposium. Um, I've decided to take the opportunity to work out some ideas I've been fiddling with for a while now. And uh, so as a warning, this um, is an early attempt at something I plan to keep working on. It's possible that your questions and comments might help shape later versions. So please don't hold back. Also, if something here interests you, piques curiosity, angers, or upsets you, and you'd like to talk about it, email me. I'd like to hear what you have to say. Um, okay. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to begin with a slightly modified opening to a piece I originally wrote some years back for the online publication Aeon and later adapted into a chapter on boredom for my book. For context, the following describes events that happened in 2013. What follows is an account of an instance where I, a person of relatively sound mind and body, could not believe the evidence before my own eyes. It might not have been a hallucination, but it was surely a great jolt and a consciousness rearranged. The scene, I'm in my closet-sized cabin inside a white geodesic dome built to house a crew of six for four months as part of an isolation experiment. As a crew, we are working and living as explorers stationed on the surface of Mars. Our outpost is NASA funded, but it is situated quite a bit closer to home on a remote slope of Mauna Loa, a volcano on the island of Hawaii. It's only a couple of weeks before the end of the mission and I'm sitting on my bed with my laptop sorting data from a sleep study I've been conducting on myself and my crewmates for the past three months. My cabin door is open. From the corner of my eye, I see a stranger walk into the washroom a few meters away. That's odd, I think, for a stranger to be here. Our doors are not locked during the day, but our habitat is positioned in an isolated area at a high elevation, far from paved roads and pedestrians. The sight of an unfamiliar person nonchalantly using our facilities is enough to jack my senses to high alert. I watch as the stranger goes into the washroom and splashes water on his face. Do I know him? Why can't I tell? If he's an intruder, why is he here? And what will he do when he's done freshening up and sees me staring at him? I have three male crewmates and the man washing his face looks like none of them. Our crew commander shaves his head while this man has thick brown hair slicked back. Another crewmate almost always wears button up long sleeve shirts. The stranger is in a baggy black t-shirt. My third male crewmate is larger than the unfamiliar man and has curly red hair and a beard. This man is clean shaven. Finally, the stranger steps out of the bathroom and confronts me. What? He says, less a question, more a bark. His voice knocks me back to reality. It's Simon, our redheaded engineer, who has evidently shorn his beard and lost more weight over the mission than I had previously noticed. Still, my heart is racing and a surge of blood warms me from earlobe to toes. I didn't know who you were, I say. He nods and gives a slight smile. Then we both laugh uneasily at the absurdity of it. Having had no direct contact with the outside for months now, an intruder is almost too impossible to imagine. 
And it was shortly thereafter, as a tail end of my terror entwined with the emergent joy of relief that I noticed I hadn't felt anything so strongly in months. I had been living in a kind of torpor. I believed myself to be quite busy and occupied with important tasks during our time on Mars, but somewhere along the way, mental fatigue had become my baseline state. I was loath to admit it at the time because it implied a poor personality match with adventurers and those of the explore, explorer class in which my crew and I, acting earnestly as astronaut stand-ins, saw ourselves. Yet in retrospect, there was no escaping it. I was bored and had been bored for quite some time. Now, the question of boredom came up on our mission when a journalist from the New York Times emailed us about a story she was writing on astronaut boredom during long missions in general. Were we bored, she asked. As a crew, we discussed it. That night at dinner around the table, sitting in the same seats we'd sat in since the first day we arrived, wearing the same clothes and the same configurations as most days, eating off the same white plates out of the same white bowls, the same condiments lined up before us, drinking water as usual, we all agreed, absolutely not. How could we be bored? We truly always felt busy. There was always something to do. There were chores and research and surveys and correspondences. How could anyone be bored if you were this busy? One simple definition of boredom is that it's a kind of low arousal state that leads to a feeling of discomfort. In some cases, in some people, this discomfort leads to positive action, seeking out new activity, engaging in pro-social behavior, or just getting so much needed rest. In other people, in other cases, it can lead to seeking stimulus in less beneficial ways, constant complaint, self-harm, substance abuse, harming others, falling into despair and depression. Still, a third way is to not realize you're bored at all, that your sensory channels are barely open, that you're not really picking up on important environmental cues, such as unusual behavior from a crewmate or improperly functioning equipment that's critical to keeping you alive. The problem is, if you ask astronauts, they'll almost never say they're bored. After all, they're in space, which is very exciting, is it not? This makes the bored astronaut almost impossible to study. But over time, the sameness of an environment, even a space station, can wear on anyone, even the supposed superhumans NASA chooses to send into orbit. As a crew of not quite astronauts on a simulated mission, we were different in that we were chosen for the express purpose of talking about how we felt whether it was good or bad. But boredom somehow was still taboo. A trip to Mars and back would take nearly two years. Much of that time would be spent in a cramped capsule, eight months there and eight months back. It would be smart to assume boredom will happen regardless of how busy and engaged astronauts tell you they are. And more importantly, to fully understand how each member of the crew deals with their own particular boredom. Before Mars, I too believed I didn't get bored. Give me a paperclip and I'll show you how fascinating. Upon further inspection, turning the facets of the jewel, so to speak, my ability to be easily entertained by dust floating in a sunbeam or constantly making future plans seen in another light are just coping mechanisms of the easily bored. And on our mission without realizing it, I'd stopped coping. Instead, I'd settled into low-grade boredom, a gray blanket that wasn't soft enough to provide comfort, but wasn't so itchy that I wanted to throw it off just vaguely wrapped around me, keeping a lot of the good stuff out. Knowing your own brand of boredom is especially useful in pandemic times, when a January is an entire year and a spring is indistinguishable from a surprisingly nice Wednesday. I sincerely hope you've found ways to keep your own coping mechanisms greased and oiled over the past couple of years. After Mars and becoming more aware of my boredom tendencies, I started seeing boring things everywhere. Or more accurately, I started to note my aversions and then recognize the associated feelings as boredom. This activity has been a kind of window of sorts, creeping into what is for me a new kind of interestedness and I, that I direct now quite liberally. So at this point, we're entering the, phase, the language boredom phase of the talk, a warning. If you're a person who uses social media of any kind, in any kind of soothing way, as I find myself doing too much, it's likely that you are bored there. You likely go back for the intermittent reinforcement of the cleverest or weirdest or most agonizing videos or a joke or next level comment that drips that precious serotonin. But most of the scroll is only ever some variation on a theme, boringly, tragically, like death, but for the living, and here we are, still so young. 
I almost don't even want to use the phrases that come up so frequently, but I will. This, same, it me, and other context niche specific responses, or the same heart and fire emojis that constant use has smoothed the Vinny meaning. At the very least, give me some ballerina slippers, or better yet, the dye, as in something to throw. In 1897, an important long poem by French poet Stéphane Mallarmé was published, called A Throw of the Dice Will Never Abolish Chance, or A Roll of the Dice, or Dice Thrown, depending on the translation. This work is considered experimental because the typography varies in size and style. Its lines snake across the crease of the book onto the opposite page and conventional syntax, grammar, and punctuation is abandoned. Mallarmé's work became a template for what is now called concrete poetry, a kind of poetry that plays with the materiality of language, that language is made up of marks on a surface, symbols. And as much as words symbolize, pointing to images, et cetera, beyond themselves, their physical existence can also be deconstructed and reconstructed anew, an act that opens up even further imaginal realms. Here's an example of the kind of strangeness you can get if you follow this thinking path. The English word spelled lowercase b, lowercase e, lowercase d, actually looks like a bed. One that's on the shorter side, but still a bed, a place to rest or do other things. You put your head at one end and your feet at the other. But what about the word spelled uppercase b, lowercase e, lowercase d? Now the headboard is taking up too much space. The whole proportion is wrong. Uppercase bed feels very cramped. But maybe that's okay because symbolically you can conjure something new here. For instance, the Greek figure Procrustes, son of Poseidon, who was a metal worker, a bandit, and an all around villain. He brought victims to his iron bed where he would either stretch them or cut off their legs to fit. People died for not fitting the bed. Remember the story next time you encounter an arbitrary standard that purports to measure success. Think of the harm it does to cut or stretch yourself to this Procrustean standard. So the word bed, already in a secret, not so obvious way, depending on your knowledge of old stories, accommodates both a soft place to relax as well as the violence of Procrustes, in addition to the current idiomatic usage of the word Procrustean. And it's cool that the uppercase version brings the violence out even more, that such a small change adding an oversized headboard can make the situation even more severe. This is just one example of what a single word can hold. Of course, you can also look at the homonyms, its etymology, possible puns, the way it makes your lips and tongue and jaw move when you say it, rhymes and anagrams. You can do all sorts of things to see a universe in a word. Microscope and telescope is what I recommend. And then when you make words at your medium, as Mallarmé did and others who followed, when you put them in unusual context next to unusual words or estrange them in some way, as almost all poets do, or at least should, a simple single word like bed can reveal all sorts of things that were there all along. This sort of thinking is very useful if you're easily bored. Language is everywhere, but most of it is used to keep us moving along, to explain things or get us to a supposed endpoint as efficiently as possible. The direct transfer of information, please, no flourish. Cliches do this, like a little patch of ice gets you there a split second faster without any extra effort. Or worse, the appearance of flourish, where there is none, because no one thinks about the horror of throwing the baby out with the bathwater or the nonsense of giving an inch and having someone take a mile. Cliches offer a kind of dulling effect, which can be dangerous in certain political contexts. I'm thinking of phrases such as the other side or both sides. The more you hear these phrases, the less likely you are to believe that there could possibly be more than two sides to an argument or that people who have differing experiences or opinions are more complicated than they might first appear. Indeed, opposition might not need to be the defining characteristic of an adversarial relationship, but it's hard to remember that if disagreements are equated with one side against another as oft repeated language seems to insist. Especially in an era of machines and reproducibility and productivity measures and tracking apps, an era of social media where language is used to signal in-group status and if used incorrectly signals that you are either out of touch or worse, hostile, to estrange your language to forgo the cliche is risky. 
think about it. Why would you make strange the very thing that is critical to your social acceptance or to making money and therefore living, eating, and if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger and friends on Mars in the movie Total Recall, breathing oxygen supplied to you by a corporation. But this estrangement, and yes, I'm aware I'm using the word estrange as opposed to estrange, I would like to argue is also more important to life than money because too much of the usual and the predictable is in a spiritual way the same as death, the antidote to which is art. A quote from the Russian formalist Viktor Shlavsky's essay, Art as Device, written in 1917. And so in order to return sensation to our limbs, in order to make us feel objects, to make a stone feel stony, a man has been given the tool of art. The purpose of art then is to lead us to a knowledge of a thing through the organ of sight instead of recognition. By estranging objects and complicating form, the device of art makes perception long and laborious. The perceptual process in art has a purpose all its own and ought to be extended to the fullest. Art is a means of experiencing the process of creativity. The artifact itself is quite unimportant. Thus, defamiliarization counteracts cliche. Slowing down and perceiving the unrecognized, unfamiliar is the way to live life, to bleed blood, to bite with all your teeth. It happened when my Martian crewmate was made strange to me. I woke up and saw something new, including myself. Let's go back to Mars for a minute. Let me tell you about the day-to-day. -day. Breakfast Monday through Saturday at 8.30 and a daily meeting that followed. Then I'd hop on the treadmill with headphones listening to a book or a podcast and say I was walking to work, a little joke that my crewmates either ignored or tolerated for four months. And then 20 minutes later, I'd sit down at my laptop for whatever tasks beckoned. We exercised, did chores, we made food, filled out surveys about our emotional and physical states, we conducted our own research projects and we wrote emails to friends, family, and colleagues back home and to mission support. On Wednesday and Saturday nights, we'd watch movies together. We went outside and we went outside in oversized hazmat suits that simulated spacesuits. We'd take pictures, explore caves, and collect rocks. Because I was also the crew writer, I spent a lot of time in my room reading and trying to write. One of the ways to simulate the isolated feel of a real Mars mission is to delay the communications with Earth for a certain length of time. Depending on where each planet is and its respective orbit around the sun, it can take up to 24 minutes for a message to span the gap, even flying at the speed of light. So to mimic the distance, our outgoing and incoming emails were delayed by 20 minutes. Also, there was no live internet. To learn something new, we had to ask mission support to send us a downloaded Wikipedia page. Doom scrolling wasn't yet a thing, and if it had been, it would have been blissfully impossible. But at least we still had email. For me, this was a lifeline out and particularly crucial as I began to miss socializing with people who were not the five I ate nearly every meal with for four months. Most importantly, nearly every day, my then wife would send me an email with a poem that had something to do with space. Before the mission, she'd solicited our writer friends to contribute poems they liked, 120 in total, one for every day on Mars. It was a thoroughly thoughtful and generous gift and, came and became a kind of interplanetary salon for two, educational and enriching, if not also at times obligatory. But for me, imagining these poems sent over such a gap in time and space got me thinking about the nature of the poem in general, its essence as a kind of ethereal transmission. Later, I found an Eileen Miles poem actually entitled Transmission. And the link to this poem is in the chat. It's the first link that's up there if you want to um, take a look at it. It's a skinny little thing that cascades quickly down the page. The first nine lines are, I'm overcome by cr the cruelty of nature. No, I mean, I'm with it and each little capacity it has can't be transferred. There's an everydayness to this poem, which is very Miles in New York school, kind of hard comfort and always a tenderness. In the poem, the reader meets a spruce and a dog and a friend, Joe. There are mountains and a planet old and splashy 
there are prisoners in jail, a notebook, a cunt, and no phone. The poem ends, I don't even think my thoughts, you do. To me, this poem is about multiple kinds of transmissions, multiple ways that gaps are spanned, the way a message is moved across. First, there's a transmission of poem to poet. So the poem can exist in a broader shared world. The strange thing about a poem is where did they come from? Sometimes to some poets, the poem seems to appear from the outside and just happens to be caught by the pen or the keyboard or a trap in the mind. Some people credit the muse. Miles writes, overcome and being with nature. Or maybe it's a thunderous train of air. This account from writer Elizabeth Gilbert on Vermont poet Ruth Stone's experience of the poem. It was like a thunderous train of air and it would come barreling down at her over the landscape. And when she felt it coming, because it would shake the earth under her feet, she knew she only had one thing to do at that point. That was to, in her words, run like hell to the house so as she would be chased by this poem. The whole deal was that she had to get to a piece of paper fast enough so that when it thundered through her, she could collect it and grab it on the page. Other times she wouldn't be fast enough. So she would be running and running and she wouldn't get to the house and the poem would barrel through her and she would miss it. And it would continue on across the landscape looking for another poet. There are so many ways of looking at this kind of transmission. It's actually a sort of subgenre of fable, what you get when you ask a poet where a poet comes from. For reasons that will become obvious, I'm partial to the description from San Francisco poet Jack Spicer. In his summer 1965 Vancouver lecture series, he speaks on automatic writing, the act of the poet getting out of the way of the words that come, likening the poet to a radio receiving transmissions or being invaded by parasites or taking dictation from a Martian source that rearranges the blocks in a poet's head. The more you know, the more languages you know, he says, the more building blocks the Martians have to play with. So that's one kind of transmission, the poem condensing into something the poet can capture. But, other, but the other kind of transmission, the one I was most interested in in my time on Mars, reading poems daily, and the one that Miles ends their poem with where the speaker doesn't speak their thoughts, you do. Sorry, where the speaker doesn't think their thoughts, you do was the transmission from poet to reader. It occurred to me that a great deal of information was being sent in the tiny package of a poem. Now, at this point, I hadn't studied poetry formally or done much thinking about poems in a formal sense. I'm a little embarrassed to say. My educational background was almost exclusively in science, specifically laser physics and chemistry with some math. And then I spent most of my 20s and into my early 30s as a science and technology journalist. My job was to convey information as efficiently as possible. Though I can say, thanks to my upbringing, I've always had an interest in language in its purest forms, in language play and its music. It's just a fact of my life that I didn't pull it all together into poetry until later. Anyway, as I was reading these poems sent across the imagined void between Earth and Mars, I began to see the compression of a poem as a miracle, that within a few hundred words or less, an entire universe could flash into existence and tendril out into other universes. Poem universes can talk to other poem universes across time and space. Each read of a poem can create a new one and each individual poem reader swims in their own soup of stars. But of course, as Miles writes, and each little capacity it has can't be transferred. You're never going to get the whole story, impossible to. Not the story of the universe or the poet or the message. You're only ever going to get your own thoughts the blocks that the Martians will mess with if and when you let them, your own ideas of what the spruce is or the dog or no phone. But you can still see it, still feel it. The poem is alive and with it, the message of the poem, whatever that means to you, your own ideas previously invisible to you detonated upon unwrapping the few hundred words, the universe. That is if the poem works as it should, not all poems, not all collections of words behave in this way. What is, it that makes a poem, what is it that makes a poem hit? If I feel physically as if the top of my head were taken off, I know that is poetry, wrote Emily Dickinson. Yes, but how is it done? Obviously much depends upon the receiver. There are many poets 
whose work I simply could not engage with until suddenly I could, something to do with experience or maybe the angle of light coming into my room, I don't know. And what a joy to return again and again to favorite poems and collections of poems only to discover that it's a completely different work from the last time I visited. To me, one of the most salient aspects of a poem that makes it create that new universe and take tops off heads is its ability to surprise. Surprise, as the stranger in the Mars habitat revealed, is an antidote to boredom and works in concert with the estrangement of language. Surprise, by definition, is a low probability activity. It's a thing, it's a thing that won't usually happen or is unlikely or unfamiliar. I'm channeling Mallarmé's thrown dice here, but I'm also channeling information theory, which is a mathematical underpinning of all digital communications and media. What allows sights and sounds to be compressed and moved across air and optical fiber into your eyes and ears. Every Zoom presentation watched, every movie streamed, every song played, every text message sent is a circus of information compressed into the knob of a ringmaster's cane, something like a poem. Information theory, a field invented by Claude Shannon in the late 1940s, makes use of this fact that any information worth transmitting, makes use of the fact that any information worth transmitting will not be random noise. There will be structures within it and patterns that make the thing predictable more or less. And if it's predictable, it is compressible. Language, for instance. Rules of language Rules of languages dictate that certain letters are more or less likely to follow other letters, just as certain words are more or less likely to follow other words. I set my keys on the t. Chances are the last word in the sentence is table. Because of this probability, you don't need to send every single piece of information. You can lose some of it for the sake of sending a smaller package. If you've played the new online game Wordle, you're using some of the same ideas used in information theory. The fact that most language is boring and therefore predictable is good for information theory and therefore compression. While much poetry operates within set forms or structures, the sonnet, the sestina, the pantoum, just to name a few, and of course the untold numbers of rhythmic and rhyme schemes as well, the true delight in poetry is when your expectations have been thwarted, the rhyme slanted, or the poet breaks her own rules. In short, poetry doesn't allow you to know what's coming next. In a wonderful and enthralling way, the poem is full of surprise. The poem full of surprise is already in its most compressed form. It is its own branch of information theory. Nothing, not even the repetitions, which themselves can spur something new within a reader on each occurrence, can be removed without altering the integrity of the poem's universe. Robert Frost wrote an essay called The Figure a Poem Makes that he used to introduce the 1939 edition of his collected poems. In it, he writes, no surprise for the writer, no surprise for the reader. Thankfully, the Martians don't tell us why they're moving the blocks like they do. I left that Mars mission myself somewhat rearranged, sensitive in new ways, even more willing to be further rearranged than the years that followed. Poetry fit nicely into this new self for many reasons, not least of which was the studying of it, was that the studying of it and making of it seemed to me to be one of the most reliable coping mechanisms to boredom in general and language boredom in particular I had come across. I'll close with one of my favorite poems. I could talk about it for hours. There's so much here. It's uh, also linked in the chat. It's that second link. Poet's Work by Lorraine Nadeker. Grandfather advised me. Learn a trade. I learned to sit at desk and condense. No layoff from this condenser. Thank you very much for your time and precious attention. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I'm not sure if um, 
I can't I can't hear anything. It oh, okay, sorry. Am I not close enough? Had to. Yes. Excellent. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah. So I was saying, um, I don't know if I have, uh, I'll say I, I would start out asking questions and then we'll maybe involve uh, students with their questions. And I'm not sure I have the right questions for you now because I didn't quite know what you, how, what angle you would take and uh, how you would approach this topic. So maybe I have the wrong questions, <laughs> the boring questions, but we'll see. But anyways, I'm, I'm gonna get started with that. Um, the first thing I guess I would like to ask is, could you explain a little bit what this simulated Mars mission was? Because I think a lot of the students here sort of don't really know exactly what you're referring to there. Could you just give a little bit of background there? Sure. High Seas was a, a five-year-long NASA-funded study to simulate uh, conditions on like a Mars mission on the surface of Mars. And the idea was if you put six astronaut-like people in a habitat and, and isolate them under Mars-like conditions, like I mentioned, the, the delayed communications and the isolation from, you know, uh, the rest of humanity, essentially Earth, then um, and ask them questions, have them fill out surveys, um, have them do their own research, uh, and, you know, conduct research on them, uh, then you can get some pretty useful data when you are eventually designing a mission to send astronauts to Mars. So at the time of this mission, we were the first crew, it was 2013, there was no planned Mars mission. Uh, still, NASA's Mars missions are a little bit fuzzy. We don't know um, what they're thinking there. But the the hope was with high seas that um, NASA could at least get some useful data to design a, a better future imagined mission to Mars. Mm -hmm. OK. Um, and I. Um... I did read your book uh, once upon a time, um, I lived on Mars, I think it was called or something like that. And you actually talk about how this simulated Mars experience has changed you. And, um, and it has changed you say in terms of um, how you think about space exploration. And it seems to also have changed you in terms of how you think about journalism and poetry and essay writing and that sort of thing. So I guess my first question to you would be, um, how has it changed your thoughts about, about space exploration? And also, um, why is it, I mean, you actually say, you do actually say that it changed you, you in terms that you now prefer essays and poetry over journalism. So I'm kind of curious as to why that is. So maybe you could explain a little bit more about that. Sure, sure. So um, in terms of space exploration, I think I saw a little bit more of how that was done. I, I was always on the outside of it. And then when you're on the inside, you sort of, you recognize that this is, um, this is a human system like any other. And it has those sort of human failings in the way that uh, decisions are made uh, often because of cultural pressures or just legacy because earlier decisions were made. And I'm speaking um, kind of vaguely, specifically about like how astronauts are selected um, I was just looking it up, you know, I have some numbers in my book, but that came out a couple of years ago. Um, something like 60 women have been to space um, and something like 600 people total have been to space. 10% of the people who've been to space are women. Now, you know, NASA started um, evening out its uh, astronaut selection in terms of gender. Uh, in the early 80s when the space shuttle program began and they um, began accepting like uh, non-military uh, astronauts, people who had more of an academic background, mission specialists, so to speak. So, um, so it's strange that, let's see, 40 years now, <laughs> um, these astronaut classes have actually like had more women in them and yet total, the total number of human women who have been sent to space is 10% of the total number of humans sent to space. So, you know, just, just kind of looking at the reality of the situation and recognizing that um, there are forces that are operating that like really aren't into changing. And, and it's, it's interesting too, to think about, um, you know, space exploration in terms of risk or in terms of, um, innovation. At NASA, um, I've heard it described that NASA is a jobs company. You know, it has many centers spread throughout 
um, the US. And so much of its bu budget actually does not go at all to human spaceflight, which, you know, it could be argued more should go or less. You know, I, I understand both um, of those angles and like some of the nuances in that. But um, NASA for years hasn't really been pushing the boundary of space. It hasn't had a, a clear directive. So, um, you know, I just, I just kind of saw, I, I, I saw a little bit of how the sausage was made and I, I was like, oh, this is interesting. And I included some of that in the book as well, you know, just, just um, seeing things that I hadn't seen before and, um, and, and trying to put it into, into context. And in terms of the second part of the question, how it changed my writing, um, you know, I was trained as a writer to do what I talk about in this, um, this lecture early on is to get to the point uh, as efficiently as possible, as clearly as possible to, um, to, you know, there's a purpose. The writing that I did was useful and um, explanatory. And uh, while I was on Mars, I did a different kind of writing. I did more journaling than I, than I ever had. And I, um, you know, I read, I read these poems and, in this way that was, I mean, it was essentially NASA inadvertently funded a writer's retreat for me. And <laughs> I, I did just like different, I, 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 I became different as a writer, you know, um, and I learned how to um, insert myself into the stories that I was telling um, before as a journalist, you're supposed to be objective or at least pretend to be, which is not possible. Um, but you know, people like to think that it it can be done, and I, I became increasingly frustrated with the sort of fallacy of the objective observer, um, and and like supposedly having to play that role, it, it didn't sit right with me, and so I just I um, it it kind of like started me on this path into um, like investigating how for myself I could write um, as honestly as possible, like honoring the the sort of blocks uh, that are able to be rearranged in my head by Martians, um, as Jack Spicer says, but also honoring, uh, you know, the, the workings of my heart as well and seeing what I could do as a writer to um, bring those two things I mean, it's actually more, it's more than heart and mind. It's, it's like a whole body experience. So kind of write with a, a body, um, a person who has a body in this world right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, so <laughs> because bodies, bodies were very prominent um, on this mission, you know, it was the idea of the inputs and outputs of a body were monitored constantly. And that was, um, you make, makes you very aware of the fact that <laughs> you're corporeal. So would you say it was the extremeness of that experience that actually pu pushed you in a way to the opposite in a, in a sense that you started out as a scientist and then this extreme experience, this, uh, this scientific mission, if you want, uh, because the cruelty of it or the one-sidedness of it, which makes it hard, the boredom and these sorts of things, the isolation, the deprivations in terms of water and food and that kind of stuff, outcomes at the other end of person that's actually pushed towards the arts that becomes an artsy person. I mean, I know this is an oversimplification, but it often, it seems to me it often is that when we are put uh, through some really extreme experience where we are, where that is too one-sided, that is too much focused on one thing, then there's this sort of natural reaction towards the opposite. Um, and um, I don't know if this was the case for you, but also, I mean, um, in terms of your crewmates, did you notice anything or do you know anything about them? Did they make this sort of um, turn in another direction after that experience? Maybe you could say, you know, the diametrically opposed. Well, I really like uh, your assessment of that. I think that there is something to the fact that like here I was presented with like a body a quantified and like essentially the desire um, that an engineer has to mechanize the human body for space because um, it's the messiest thing you put up there. The other systems are able to be built in very predictable ways, but the human body and especially the human psyche is, is incredibly unpredictable. And um, as Kim Bin said, the founder of the, the High Seas Project has said, um, like if, 
if mental health fails um, on a long mission to Mars, it could be as disastrous as if a rocket explodes. And so, you know, this, this study was interested in the human side of things, but it was within the context of a mechanized body and, and mind um, to fit into the system of space life. Um, I think that I've always sort of had leanings. Um, like I, it's not that I'm, I'm not, I hadn't been uh, like an artful person. I was just home um, in Kansas last December and um, I came across some early work and drawings that I did and a book that I made. Funny because the book was actually like all about cats, which is like very much let me explain something to you. But my um, my drawings and paintings surprised me because they were they were very like strange the way that I drew the sun or trees or um, like a pair of owls. I was like, oh, this is this is like a, a child who isn't into being precise. You know, this is a child who's into um, making things a little stranger. So um, it's like, I think that I've had throughout my life, I've had, um, you know, a push and pull between like a, a directness and um, exposition and then, and but also a sort of like, more nebulous, dreamy way of, of seeing the world. And as for my um, crewmates, well, it, it, everyone responded in their own ways. It, it was really interesting. Uh, one uh, of the crewmates left the isolation of the dome and bought a sailboat and lives in the isolation of a sailboat. You know, so like it almost like, um, he almost doubled down um, on that. And one of my crewmates, Cyan Proctor, Dr. Cyan Proctor became a pilot in the first uh, uh, civilian crewed space mission that happened last September that SpaceX sent up. Um, it was a crew of four in a Dragon capsule and she was the pilot of the Dragon capsule. So, um, but she actually only got that position because she had during the pandemic embraced her more artistic side. So it wasn't the Mars mission for her that changed her. It was the fact that she, you know, she's she's an adventurer. She travels a ton, but for the first time in her life, she was forced to sit still, and that forced stillness um, allowed a sort of a more creative side to flourish. And it was through her like space art that she was able, and also just her, you know, skills in, you know, she's a professional pilot. A, a PhD, an educator. Um, she had been a, um, a member of the Explorers Club even before she became an astronaut. Um, you know, all of these things combined into making her this um, ideal selection for the seat that she she took on that um, inspiration for a mission. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're talking about Claude Shannon, uh, the father of uh, modern information theory. And um, so Claude Shannon, uh, he was an engineer, uh, but he was also a very playful person. So somebody who was interested in uh, very many things, had very wide interests. And uh, so he was also, of course, into physics and mathematics, but language and poetry as well. And I guess in many ways, um, you could think that because he had these wide interests, he was somebody who transgressed these boundaries between the arts and the sciences. He actually managed to come up with something as fantastic as information theory, something uh, a way to quantify information, um, to talk about it in terms of concrete ways, uh, something that was an abstract concept that before seemed to belong more into philosophy or linguistics, all of a sudden uh, could, could transgress these boundaries and could be made, I mean, useful in other ways. And so many people have hailed him as a genius, and I, I think he was uh, absolutely a very fascinating person, a very creative person. Um, do you feel that, so uh, in many ways, I mean, I see you also as somebody who is, has a, a sort of a foot in both of these camps, the sciences and the arts, and um, who actually manages to navigate these two sides very successfully, or is good at both of them, which I think is difficult too. First of all, for a lot of people to acquire that knowledge to be good in both of them. Um, would you say that you are, or that, uh, you know, you immersing yourself in both of these sides has actually made you a more creative person or that it has changed you in other ways? Um, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Made, yeah. Well, 
Um, you know, I, I've just followed my interest when I, as I've had them. And, you know, some people are really excellent at synthesizing, um, like multiple modes of thinking, uh, at once, you know, and I, I've tended to, <clears throat> uh, you know, go hard in one category and then like kind of shift directions and go hard in another category and then like shift directions again. And so honestly, I feel like I'm a little bit at the beginning of um, bringing multiple areas of, of um, knowledge and, and ways of thinking together. It's, uh, it's something that is fun uh, to do. And, you know, and, and, and it always depends on the context. I've heard something about like creativity being described as just like, or inventor, inventors, like famous inventors, uh, like tend to like see something from another area. Mathematicians do this too. I mean, like you just, you just see this where people see something from another area and then they say, oh my gosh, you know, I'm gonna steal that, grab that and, and then apply it to some different domain. And, and it makes you realize that I mean, this is an incredibly general <laughs> statement, but everything is the same. If you can, if you can take something from over here and put it over here and like, and, and completely change this thing over here, like there's this transferability and like sameness that permeates the entire experience mm -hmm. of reality. And, and I guess, why wouldn't you want to like know as much as you can about all those things and like and bring things together and and see um see that sameness everywhere mm -hmm. you can i think that it's it's a very exciting thing when when people do do that and you exactly. know yeah, yeah. and I, I just like yeah sorry i i think it's all about the connections right because there are yeah. these invisible connections everywhere and we are trying actually i think the, the modern western the scientific project uh, you know is really to find these ways of how these things connect and sort of simplify their roles a picture of that because we actually realize there isn't just all these disconnected parts, but we actually figure out how they fit together, right? And I think there's nothing more exciting, you know, than when we are successful at that. And we are not successful very often with that in big ways, anyways, I think, you know. But when it happens, I mean, that's really where boredom gets blown up because, you know, I think that there is nothing, there's nothing better than that. But this is also why it's very hard. Um, to, you know, to find these connections and the further apart actually two domains are or fields are. Um, and if we manage to connect them, actually, the more original something is, right, the, most, the more exciting it is, because the more unexpected it is coming back to this sort of, you know, low probability kind of thing, right, nobody expects yeah. it and we all sort of just blown away by it. Yeah. Uh, no, sorry for interrupting you. Did you want to say something else? About no, this? I mean, that was just really beautifully said. I, I agree. I mean, I also do think that there is pressure, um, contemporary pressure to specialize um, and to, I mean, not just in subject matter, but almost in brand, you know, like that, that you need to make yourself as singular and as like legible to people as quickly as possible. It, it, to, to me, I mean, I feel like that there is something of that in like, like a pressure that I feel like within this whole lecture is that we um, as human beings, as complex, messy human beings um, are somewhat pressured to um, smooth ourselves out so that we can be, you know, so we can fit nicely into um, some economic model or to success, you know, the uh, Procrustean sort of trauma of, um, you know, fitting so that we can succeed. It's a, uh, it's, I think it, it is beyond language. I think it's, it's, it's a sort of thing that uh, is present to many, many people in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I have a technical question for you and I don't know if you can answer it and it may actually be a stupid question. Um, you know, something that has always baffled me is the relationship between information and meaning. Um, because, you know, so with, with, with Shannon, we have this method or we have this ability now to mathematically assess how much information flows through something and and that sort of thing so we have this ability now to manipulate information and in fact all the modern information revolution would not be happening without it um, but then i was always thinking about 
meaning, meaning is something so abstract, you know, you were saying in poetry, there, there's so much in it, there is, there's actually could be infinite what's in it, because it always depends on the context from which we approach something, who comes to see it. So you see one message in it, but then somebody else come from another angle and sees it in another way and somebody else sees it in another way. And so there are these levels of meaning in a message. And I was always wondering, how does this get addressed somehow, or does it, or, or what, what are we to make of this? This is really confusing to me personally. Yes, I mean, that's something that I haven't spent a ton of time thinking about, but it seems like okay. an absolutely ripe, uh, I mean, it's more than a question. It seems like uh, almost a field of, of questions. <laughs> and I mean, just to respond, I mean, you, you, you alluded to the thing about it. The context is, is the thing that makes a meaning. And I've seen something like, first you have data, then like next level up, it's information, then next level up, it's knowledge, next level up is wisdom. And, you know, this is a schema that I don't know if it, how true it is or how useful it is, um, but each, at each level, you're, you're adding context and gaining meaning. So, I mean, that's just my first read on it. Um, Having having just now considered this question and this idea that I think is is quite interesting. Yeah. Okay. I know this is like I said it's it's baffling to me too. But maybe it doesn't matter how much meaning it, it, it like for purposes of transferring information we can just deal with the basics and then whatever people make of it is just an added kind of layer of bonus. Like maybe the two are not connected. It's just to me this whole thing is very murky. But this is maybe because I'm not a scientist. I'm not an engineer. Uh, I don't know how to. Uh, well, I mean, it definitely does get into the philosophical questions of like a philosophical um, area of knowledge. And, and it does seem that there is something distinguishable between, you know, a physical, like the symbol of information and then like what it does symbolize you know, and which is human. It's human to symbolize, even though a symbol exists, whether a human are, is there or not. But the symbolism of that, that um, mark can only be added by some consciousness, presumably mm -hmm. human. Yeah. Um, I don't know if there's still time, but if there is, I would like to briefly come back to your mentioning um, how astronauts are selected and about this gross uh, inequality or unequalness between how many men versus how many women actually managed to be managed to get to space. And um, I have actually breached the subject with one of my classes at some point, you know, that um, I took actually the numbers from your book and it says that there are 563 people that have been to space since uh, as of July 2019 and 64 have been women, so about 10%. And when I discussed this with my, gla my class, a lot of students kind of had a hard time believing that there was something political about this. They thought, oh, this had to be biology, but there had to be some biological reason. Maybe women are not strong, like physically strong enough, right, to do this or, um, yeah, whatever. So I, I was kind of wondering, first of all, because I know you actually lay out several reasons as to why it's actually the opposite, that uh, mm -hmm. if we really based it on science and on objectivity, we would only send women to space. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could just point out what, or if you remember actually physically, what actually speaks for sending women much more so than men, if we wanted to just base it on that. Sure, I mean, even just culturally, historically, uh, women were considered before uh, the, the first astronauts uh, were selected from the te male test pilot corps in the military. Um, there, was a, there was a whole program to investigate the, the sort of like um, physiology of women under conditions of spaceflight. Turns out, um, according to these early tests, and they tested female pilots, uh, these female pilots performed better on a number of measures of um, physiological resilience under uh, conditions of, you know, in the centrifuge or, or being isolated um, for long periods of time than the men, like, as, as a group. So there, there was some early evidence for that, but, you know, this was a brand new thing, the space program. And these uh, systems were untested. I mean, you're basically lighting an explosion underneath you uh, to send you into space. So the uh, optics of sending a woman 
uh, in the in the late 50s, early 60s uh, for that when at the time in America, this was something that, I mean, what was a woman's role? It was not to be the emissary of um, an emerging global superpower. It was to take care of the home front and, you know, the, the domestic sphere. So that's a little bit of the historical background, but in terms of uh, the argument I laid out economically, um, a little tongue in cheek, to be perfectly honest, is that uh, on the on the Mars mission, on the high seas mission, I noticed that you know there are three men and three women on the crew, and without fail, the guys are eating uh, like taking seconds um, during meals, and also just like eating more generally. I noticed it just like you know, kind of in in the amb my ambient awareness, but then when I was looking at data from armbands um, that tracked uh, activity, I noticed that the caloric expenditure of the three guys was almost twice as high, like 3,000 calories. And I thought, okay, well, if you're going to have this mission to Mars, it's like roughly two years long, a huge portion of your payload is going to be food. And, you know, when you send things into space, you don't want to send heavy things. You don't want to, you want to send, um, it's cheaper to send less mass into space. So I was like, well, it's then it's cheaper to send less food if you're sending people who need less food. And the people who need less food um, are small women. And this is this is just like true metabolically. It's it's a um, a difference in muscle. It's a difference in the way that energy is processed uh, due to hormones. It's uh, there are all sorts of differences that lead to this sort of like a different metabolic rate. That means that uh, like small women in particular need less food than less, like a guy who's even five eleven. So. Um, I looked it up and it turns out that there was some precedent for this, that NASA, some NASA engineers had actually said, yes, this is, this is the case. You could, um, you, you could, it would be cheaper to send a crew of, of small women to, um, on a long mission. Now I, it's tongue in cheek because of course there are always trade-offs, um, when you're designing a mission and the payload and, you know, what you decide to, uh, save weight and money on. Um, but this seemed to be a big enough deal that um, when the Dragon, when SpaceX engineers were designing Dragon, they asked NASA to develop a meal replacement bar to get rid of a meal, um, an entire meal for astronauts. So they were thinking in terms of saving weight uh, and costs on food uh, in that regard. So like if you were actually making these decisions purely on economic models, you would send women. But because that's not how actual decisions are made, um, it's mostly men who are astronauts. Mm -hmm. um, though, uh, you are an openly gay person, and I think that's also, you discussed uh, Sally Wright, the first American astronaut that was sent into space, female astronaut, um, saying that um, she was married to, to an astronaut, a male astronaut, but so uh, in public, in the public's eye, she was a heterosexual woman, uh, but she was actually also um, a, a lesbian, a gay woman. Uh, so there's some, um, and um, so I was wondering when you realized that you wanted to be an astronaut um, um, and also knew that, that you were gay, uh, what were your thoughts? Were you worried about this? Were there some, um, you know, uh, fears, uh, some obstacles to overcome? Oh, certainly. So, I mean, I, I became this sort of analog astronaut after having, as a kid, really wanted to become an astronaut and gearing my whole educational track to becoming an astronaut. Um, I thought for a long time that I would just like, you know, keep it low. Uh, but then when I was in grad school, I, um, I just, I realized that I had like no one close to being gay, it seemed, had ever been to space. So I, I made a burner hotmail account and I emailed NASA uh, and asked them if the don't ask, don't tell policy that was uh, used in the US military at the time also applied to NASA since you know it has some, there's some military crossover. And I got a response saying, no, it didn't. But I still felt like this wasn't gonna be a thing where you could just be yourself. And you know, I've heard this uh, from a number of people, astronaut friends actually, um, NASA is pretty culturally conservative. So even though there, um, there is an out gay lesbian astronaut now, um, it's not a place where that kind of identity is celebrated. And in fact, even non-white identities are, um, 
I, I don't want to, how, how to put this, it's, it's just not an easy place to be a non-white guy um, is, is the, the fact of NASA. So um, for me, in the end, I thought, well, I actually want to have every kind of life, not necessarily just an astronaut's life. And so, um, you know, the, the, the writer's life, Susan Sontag's uh, quote, the writer's life seemed the most inclusive and, and that's what I'm going for. So um, I think I'm, I'm quite happy with, with the, the trajectory in that regard. Okay. Um, if there's time, I have one more question. Is there? Yeah, okay. Um, so there's rich billionaires like Elon Musk, right, who want to colonize Mars. And um, uh, so I was kind of curious what you think of this idea of humanity eventually settling on Mars. Uh, do you think this is realistic or would you such an endeavor even be worthwhile? Um, what's your assessment of that or opinion on that? That's an enormous question, <laughs> actually. <laughs> um, uh, I don't like that Earth has allowed billionaires to exist. <laughs> I'll start that. Uh, start with that. Um, I think Elon Musk's SpaceX, it's not just him, it is the entire company that is working, a lot of very smart people um, are doing incredibly new things for space, stuff that NASA would never do within its current structures. You know, I've also looked at space programs around the world. Um, the Indian Space Agency has a very different structure than NASA and is able to send rockets cheaply and like, and, and spin up complicated projects very quickly. It, um, you don't need to not be government run to do, to innovate and to um, make cheap, you know, make launching cheaper and and send complicated probes to other planets. So, um, but you know, in this world, it's capitalism that's that's driving innovation um, on a kind of a large scale. And SpaceX is doing some pretty surprising things now. The idea of going to Mars um, as like a Plan B planet, it it just it feels bad, um, I think, because there are so many problems here on Earth. It does feel like a bit of, you know, um, just trashing a house and moving on to another house and not not really carrying that much. Plus, Mars is a total fixer upper. It's, I mean, if if you think it's going to be difficult to live on Earth um, after climate change, like it's, I mean, you're going to be living in a cave on Mars because the radiation is just too much for any structures. It just, I mean, so you're going to become this cave dwelling race of, you know, people that could also be happening at the same time on earth. It, uh, the, the, the thinking is like, if there's an asteroid hit and there's like a total annihilation it is, is, is the worry. And that's why Mars would be a useful, um, you know, place to spread to, which Sure, the logic is is sound, um, low probability event, but high high probability of catastrophe if it were to happen, um, total catastrophe. So, you know, uh, I've I can't give you like a very solid clear answer. I have a lot of feelings about it and a lot of thoughts that sort of like entwine and bounce off of each other and oppose each other, and um, and I. Right now, I'm I'm watching it, and I'm I'm. I guess I'm curious to see what happens next. And I don't disagree with people who who don't like it. And I also think that there's a lot to be said for um, innovating in this area in terms of human exploration and what that can do for the human spirit. So um, complicated, complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand. I mean. Uh... It seems a bit unrealistic. I mean, it seems sort of like um, a, a little boy's dream or like, you know, a fantasy of like going to Mars until you actually consider all the practicalities and the, the realities of what that actually means, right? And so I don't know Elon Musk, but it seems to me his dream is a bit boy-like, a bit boyish in that sense. And I think until people actually really look at the specifics, they might fall for it. 
So, um, yeah. Um, in I, terms of in terms of the technical stuff, it's it surprised me how successful he's been. But um, the thing that SpaceX actually and absolutely has not done um, in, in in my investigation of any of it is consider the human element and like not even trying it seems and so yeah. that um that to me is a huge huge failing on in, ter in terms of this vision and so without that you wonder where it's gonna go and how far okay yeah uh, you know, I said it was the last, last question, but I just thought of one more. Um, and that is actually just, and again, maybe this is a really silly question to ask of you, but, um, you know, uh, when you signed up for this simulated uh, Mars mission, it seems to me that this was a really bad deal in the sense that you would get all of the boredom and discomfort and isolation and none of the excitement, which is actually seeing Earth from outer space, from deep space. And so you kind of took the, got the really bad part, except for maybe, you know, your life was not in danger at any point in time. And you didn't get any of the pluses. So I'm wondering, uh, what was it really that made it so attractive to you to, to want to do this and to enter into this competition with 700 ad, other applicants and that sort of thing, and to submit yourself to this for four months? Oh yeah, that's interesting. Um, I I think at the time I had thought um, that doing something hard had value, and especially mm -hmm. if doing the hard thing could um, make something that I thought was a good idea, which is human exploration of space, um, which I, I I do believe is a worthwhile endeavor in the Carl Sagan sense of it. Um, I. I, I think I wanted to contribute to the cause. And I felt like I could do that. I could endure this four months. But the other thing is, um, you know, I, I'm a person who lives in my head a lot and I like I spend plenty of time in my imagination. And it was it was a way to just like get closer to the thing that you had only imagined. And mm -hmm. um, you know, barring I, I never actually believed as an adult that I would go to Mars. I think as a kid, I had imagined, 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 you know, I would periodically check in and ask myself the question, could I do a one-way mission to Mars? Would I do a mission to Mars, you know? And through most of my um, like childhood and adolescence, when I checked in, oh yes, yes I would. And then at a certain point in my adulthood, I was like, uh, I like earth, I like my people here. I, I really don't think that I would do that. And that was one of the interview questions for, um, high seas for the mission, um, they asked, uh, would you go on a one-way mission to Mars? And I said, honestly, no. I mean, I'm very happy if this works out for me, this would, this would satisfy that, uh, that sort of itch to, to like bump my imagination a little bit closer to the, the real thing without the, the actual real thing happening. I think that was probably a good answer for them because there's something, um, yeah, a person, yeah, I, I think that they were, they were looking for, a sort of realist uh, <laughs> response. Okay, yeah, thank you, Kate. I think uh, my colleague, uh, Brian, also would like to ask a question or, yeah, so I'm just gonna. Yeah, I'm, I'm Brian. Actually, I'm not Brian, but I'm gonna ask his question. And the reason I came up here is because I just wanted to show you guys, it's not scary, come up here, ask questions feel free. Um, so a colleague, uh, Brian Abood, asked this question and it came on through the question answer, which you guys don't have access to because you're here, so you can get up here. And I'm going to ask it for him. So I'm just opening up the floor for students. And Brian's question, it just changes it a little bit. First of all, thank you uh, so much, Kate, for uh, your presentation. It was really interesting. It gave us lots to think about. You've been talking about Mars and there were some questions about that. But another one that had to go back to your language, what you're talking about language, uh, is this can and should language uh, keep us from getting bored? So I, I'll just leave that to you. Yeah, I, I hope it does. I hope uh, language is, um, is a tool that can be used to do many things. And, and I think like it can, it can convey information quickly. It can confuse people. It can you know, uh, express love. Uh, desire it can express fear and um, pain and so I, I think that language act absolutely plays a role in the question of boredom and 
language can make you bored and language can snap you out of it. Something a little related to this though is like language in terms of just letters is, um, I mean, I had this experience first um, in the early days of the Mars mission, Mars mission, and then uh, later in the early days of the pandemic where I could not read, I couldn't take in letters, words, sentences, it was impossible. Like I could maybe scroll, I could, I was, I tried to journal, I could barely write. It was, I was, I wasn't in a steady space. Um, living in New York during March and April of 2020 was pretty intense. And um, so what happened during the Mars mission, I similarly was, I felt like I was kind of thrust into this unfamiliar world and there was a lot to learn, a lot to get used to, and I couldn't focus, but I had brought with me graphic novels. And so um, the combination of language and image uh, was the thing that snapped me out of it. And I don't know if you could say that that was a boredom situation early on. It was, I, I was, I was definitely in an altered um, sort of like a psychic space for sure. But um, I was grateful for the, um, I, I think I read, Are You My Mother by Alison Bechtel. And it's a complicated text uh, because it deals with a lot of um, like psychoanalysis from Winnicott and, you know, her early childhood and her relationship to her mother. But the combination of letter of words and images uh, really got my brain going. And then I did that again during the pandemic. I read the three book series uh, called March about um, Congressman, U.S. Congressman John Lewis, who uh, was, you know, with Martin Luther King during the civil rights era. And he uh, recently passed away a couple of years ago, but um, it was, that was a very useful thing for me to do, um, a useful tool to like, not only use language as language, but language combined with image was, was very important. Um, so are there any other questions that are coming in from question answer, Ingrid, anything coming in? If anyone wants to email me later offline or contact me through social media or what have you, um, I'm available, I'm like findable online. So okay. please feel free. Do you guys have any questions and anybody wanna come up? Don't be shy. We have time for one more question. One more, we have time for one more question. I feel like you wanna say something. Come on, it's okay. All right, you're gonna come? So we have time for one more question. Here we go. Okay, I'm not tall either, so that's great. Um, I was wondering, because in the beginning when you were talking, you said that you didn't recognize your crewmate due to uh, weight loss and the changes of, you know, doing the simulation. So I was wondering, like, how harsh was the change in your diet compared to your usual diet? Like, what did you eat? What was, like, the change? Stuff like that. Yeah, such a great question. Um, not everyone lost weight. It, uh, I think I did, there, there are like different factors at play. So um, suddenly we had to work out uh, five days a week for at least 45 minutes a day. Uh, that was due to a, an exercise study that we were doing for NASA, but also to simulate like how astronauts actually have to work out a lot to maintain their body weight or their body mass and, um, and their health in the low gravity environment. So some people did lose weight um, and it most likely was due to that. But in terms of like the specifics of your question, the way diet changed was we were eating food that was, um, um, we, the, main, the main purpose of the, the mission was a food study. And so we were looking at uh, two food systems. The first was like, just add water and heat, like what astronauts do when they um, eat out of a pouch. And like, we weren't eating real astronaut food, we were eating camp, like um, backpacking food. And then the other system was um, a more creative system of food preparation that involved using um, like freeze dried and um, dehydrated <clears throat> ingredients to put together. So you could make like, like a, um, like a pizza or a, 
a cake or a beef tagine or something like that. You know, you're assembling the part, you're rehydrating and assembling the parts um, uh, made out of shelf stable ingredients. So um, it was it was a very different menu than what I'm used to. But um, you know, I had we had these really delicious egg crystals, uh, which are uh, from a company called Ova Easy. I'm not like trying to shill for them or anything, but uh, if you're looking for powdered eggs, like I've had, we had like multiple kinds and this Ova Easy kind was just like, it was exceptional. It reconstituted so well, it scrambled so fluffy. And, you know, every Sunday we had like a free day to ourselves and where we didn't have to eat. Uh, I think the the first meal we ate together was dinner on Sunday and it was the only non sort of like regimented meal. And on those mornings, I would wake up and go downstairs to the kitchen area. Other people stayed in their rooms and I would make these delicious omelets um, with with a rehydrated cheese, a shredded cheese and parsley flakes. And then like have a cup of Earl Grey tea and have um, like crackers with butter and jam on them and like that. Sunday ritual for me was really um, important. And I, I actually, to this day, love eating a simple omelet, like a Julia Child style omelet uh, with cheese and parsley and, and the, the tea with those crackers and jam. So um, I recreate that a lot. There's like a pretty strong emotional resonance there. Thanks for that question. That's a great question. We always want to know about what you're eating when you're going to Mars. <laughs> I think that's great. So if there's nothing else, um, I think that we've actually run out of time and I, and I can't really take, we can't really take any other questions, even if we wanted to. So I wanted to take a, the moment, a moment to thank you guys for coming here. Thank you very much. To thank you, Kate, for participating. Uh, Ingrid for moderating this. That was really uh, wonderful. And also just a few words about who made all of this possible. I want to thank the Faculty of General Education uh, the Vanya College Student Association, that's your guys, you guys helped out with this a lot. The Vanya College Teachers Associations. Um, I want to thank uh, Bruce Norton and his students, the tech support, they're always here for us. Communications in particular, I want to thank Brandon Calder. And of course, our technicians, David Scott and Carlos Avila, they're always here to help us out with problems. Um, Student Development and Services Office, Mary Grant, and the Humanities Symposium, of course, Brian Abood, Lisa Jorgensen, David Kalschich. Uh, Carolyn Koika and Sheila Das, thank you all for making this possible. Thank you so much for having me.